we will begin our discussion of scientific racism with perhaps the most famous uh, racist scientific development uh, that that came out of the late 18th century and early 19th century, and that would be phrenology. And phrenology is, um, I, I absolutely hate to admit this, but it's so colorfully weird that you can't help but to find it amusing. But then you realize how how serious a number of people took it, and then it goes from being amusing to being absolutely terrifying. Now, social Darwinism is not a um, it's not a, a one specific science. It's more of an overarching theory of race, ethnicity, uh, economic theory. If you were if you went to a college back in let's say oh. Uh, 1921, and uh, maybe you were a graduate student like how I am, and you wanted to take a class on social Darwinism, you really wouldn't take a class called social Darwinism. You would take probably a class on uh, the inferior races of the world. You might take certain biology classes that blend legitimate biology with uh, pseudoscientific biology, like, uh, well, like some of the ones that we're going to discuss later in this lecture. Or you might take a class on uh, hierarchical, hier hierarchical uh, racial sociology or psychology, maybe even psychiatry. But there is no one overarching science called social Darwinism. Uh, it's more of just a, a theory of how Darwin was applied. And by this point, you would have already watched the Crash Course video on Darwin and the Origin of the Species, and you would have watched the other Crash Course video on eugenics. So you are already knowledgeable about Darwin is, uh, who Darwin was, what Darwin accomplished. And while I will reiterate that as we go forward, just keep that in your mind. Those are very important videos. I will not be giving you a complete lecture on Darwin. I will talk about him, though, as we go. Now, Darwin didn't have anything to do with phrenology. Phrenology comes out of Central Europe in the Germanic area. It was developed by a man named Franz Joseph Gall. And Franz Joseph Gall and other people like him were intrigued by the human brain, namely how it functioned as an organ in the body. The brain they correctly identified was the epicenter of all of our thinking and all of, all of our planning. It's, it is the organ that makes us human in many ways. Now, I say that from a purely biological standpoint. I mean no offense to anybody who uh, sees uh, uh, something like the soul is what makes us human. I'm not trying to make a religious argument. But the brain is what really sets us apart. It's why I'm sitting here on a computer talking to you through a microphone, having a drink, and using electricity to see. It's why you're listening to me on your computers talking to you from a microphone. So the brain really sets us apart from most of our other animal brethren uh, in society. And phrenology seeks to understand how, or sought to understand how the mind developed, and if we could understand how the mind worked. Now that sounds like psychiatry, it sounds like neuroscience, and at one point it was considered legitimate, but it very quickly fell out of favor us in the academic world, but just because it fell out of favor in the academic world doesn't mean that it fell out of favor in the popular world. And so we're going to talk about phrenology from purely its racial standpoint, and uh, as well as its standpoint on superiority. So let's talk about phrenology. Well, first of all, phrenology dates back to the late 1700s, but it really comes to uh, in popularity in the mid 19th century, 18 uh, teens, 20s, 30s, really up until the Civil War. It was extremely popular in Europe and the United States uh, because it it was supposed to be a cutting edge science, even though technically it is a pseudoscience. I'm using quotes pseudoscience, a fake science, a subject that tries to masquerade itself as legitimate, but it's not actually legitimate at all. You can't really test it. It's not real. It just seems real. And it also addressed a lot of issues that were on the minds of influential European and American intellectuals and, and other thinkers. And that would be, how do other races and other people how are other how can we classify other races and other people in this world because clearly if you look at who's in power and who's not there's got to be some differences and these differences have got to be uh, physical 
and biological. And phrenology was used to, uh, it was the framework by which a lot of these people try to understand why they were, say, the owners of 500 slaves and slaves themselves were not owning 500 whites. So they were trying to justify their own place in society. Phrenology, and these, le these slides are on your lectures as well, you've probably seen them already. Phrenology divided the brain up into different corridors and different sections. They were numbered, as you can see here on this picture of the right. And you can see this uh, textbook model here on the left, that each numbered section corresponded with a certain intellectual attribute, otherwise known as an intellectual faculty. And this could range from um, uh, spontaneity, creativity, uh, discipline, it, um, mathematic, mathematical and scientific understanding. Uh, uh, what is another one? Permissiveness. And um, I'm trying to, well, I'm looking at, looking at these right here. Sublimity, consciousness. I'm just reading them off right now. Essentially, all of the behavioral elements that make up the human personality, each corridor, each section of the brain uh, was divvied up in this way. Now, in reality, the brain is divided up and you have your frontal lobes and your, your uh, brain stem and things like that. But this was not really the same thing. They, they were trying. And of course, they had no understanding of the brain like we do today. And even we don't fully understand the brain. But they were trying to apply all of these human behavior characteristics to these different sections. And how would they understand this? Were they examining the brain directly? Not really. What they would do is they would examine the skull. And the skull itself was numbered. And they would look at the ridges of the skulls and see how the brain functioned within. You could do this on a person who was alive, or you could examine a corpse by removing the head and then opening up the skull. The idea being that when you looked at the skull, you could see the ridge lines with, uh, on the outside of the skull and then on the inside of the skull to get an idea of how large the brain was. Certain ridges suggested parts of the brain that were more active than others, whereas other ridges suggested other parts of the brain were more active than others. And through this, they would collect skulls of different types of people, whether they were black or white, Asian or American Indian, or people that had mental disabilities. And they tried to find commonalities between these. And of course, they looked at the skulls of white men, specifically white Western European uh, Protestant men. And of course, they these were white Anglo-Saxon Protestant men who were doing this. And they found within their examination, I'm using air quotes again, examination, that they found that the white skull clearly had differences from these other skulls, and therefore the white the white person, the white race, was superior. And of, of course, there were people who were, who were quote, feeble-minded, people who had mental disabilities. And those people, regardless of their race, you could read their mental, uh, you could read their, you could read their mental, um, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. You could read their, uh, their handicap within the skull by looking at, again, certain ridges, certain shapes, certain sizes. And that is what phrenology is. There's a little bit more to it than that. They grouped other things together, but essentially that's what it is, an examination of these traits of these behaviors through the size of the skull, the ridges of the skull, trying to determine how people act and why people act based on their race and their ethnicity and their, their um, mental capacities. This is an optional video that I'm giving. It's from the movie Django Unchained. I don't know if we have any film buffs out there, but Django Unchained came out in 2012. It was an excellent movie written and directed by Quentin Tarantino. If you don't know who Quentin Tarantino is, he's the guy that did Pulp Fiction and Kill Bill. His movies are a little bit, uh, well, they're, they're a genre of their own. They're a little bit crazy. And they're also kind of um, R-rated, in, in I don't put that mildly. Now, this clip features Leonardo DiCaprio explaining phrenology, and I would not use this necessarily as the textbook description of phrenology, but DiCaprio, act, DiCaprio, and I assume it was Tarantino who wrote the dialogue, actually did a very good job at kind of really summarizing 
phrenology. Remember, phrenology is a pseudoscience, so it's going to be a little weird. It's not going to be particularly realistic, but there are people who really believe this. I do want to warn you, if you watch this clip, there is some some tough language, and it's not actually as bad as uh, as what what uh, other Tarantino movies have, and especially this one. This scene is very um, is not R rated, but there that I would consider. But it is again. He's he Leonardo DiCaprio is talking to Jamie Fox, who's an excellent African American actor, and he's doing it specifically to taunt him. So there is going to be some racial tension here. So if you choose to watch it, uh, you'll definitely see an interesting discussion of phrenology. If you choose not to, you're not missing out. This lecture will suffice, uh, but I leave that entirely up to you. So take a moment, pause this video, watch the clip if you choose to, then come back to this, and we will conclude this section on phrenology. Now that you've watched the clip, which I hope that you did enjoy, uh, think about what DiCaprio his character was talking about what things he was kind of zooming in on. He was talking about the ridges. He was talking about bone marks. He was talking about uh, submissiveness versus creativity, leadership, uh, things of that nature. This was a very, again, very popular pseudoscience throughout the 19th century, especially before the Civil War. And although it does begin to die out as a science it, over the course of the 1880s, 1890s, and into the early 20th century, there are still people who draw on these ideas and kind of incorporate them more and more into their view of the world, into their social Darwinistic views. They may not be using phrenology anymore in the traditional sense as we see it here, or as we see it here, the, the, these skulls are from the uh, Phrenology Museum, and this is what they did. Again, you can see how they mark them all up with numbers to show you, you know, why certain thing, wh why these people behaved a certain way by the size of these sections, each section pertaining to a certain behavioral trait, as you see over here on the left. They may not be going in this direction as explicitly, but they are still kind of viewing this world, uh, th their place in this world racially and ethnically as a, as a system of hierarchies in which the shapes of heads, skin color, um, behavior, uh, all these things represent racial and ethnic superiority that you can calculate and quantify scientifically. And this, of course, is pseudoscientific, but that does not mean that people were not doing this, including people who were legitimate uh, scientists and academics. So just keep that in mind. We'll be moving forward now into polygenism. So this video will now end, and we will continue and pick up with polygenism on the next video.